Good morning. I have uh, two main goals for my uh, lesson this morning. Number one, that God is glorified. Number two, that you are encouraged. Knowing God. You know, we all have within us a hunger and a thirst and a desire to know God. As we read earlier, the call to worship, the psalmist said in Psalm 24, 1, as a deer pants for streams of water, my soul pants for you. My soul thirsts for the living God. I kind of feel like that at times, like the psalmist. Psalm 63, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. Paul wrote in Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ. And I feel the same way. I want to know God. But anyway, in many ways, God is a mystery. 1 Timothy 3.16 writer says, Paul says, beyond all questions, the mystery of godliness is great. God is incomprehensible. He is the holy other. He's far beyond our understanding. Job's friends ask him this historical, historical, rhetorical question. It's a history too, you know, he, back in the day. The rhetorical question, John, Job 11, 7, can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? And then Paul writes in his doxology in Romans 11, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his paths far beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of God and who has been his counselor? And finally, Isaiah 55, Isaiah writes, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are beyond your ways, declares the Lord. And think about the power of God's word, how he spoke the universe into existence. Psalm 147, Isaiah 40, both say that God has placed every star out there in the universe right where he wants it. And get this, he has a name for every star. That blows me away. Trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of stars. He has a name for each one. I sometimes have trouble with my nine grandkids. Which one are you? <laughs> and yet he knows a number of hairs on our head when an animal falls in the forest. I can't wrap my mind around God. He is incomprehensible. A.W. Tozer writes this. So let us begin with God. Back of all, above all, before all, God is all. First in sequential order, above in rank and station, exalted in dignity and honor. So we ask the question, if God is incomprehensible, how can we know God? Good question. I'm glad you asked. We can know God through Jesus Christ. Jesus came to show us the Father. God reveals himself through Jesus, and he desires our relationship. John 17, 3, uh, Jesus prayed in our text uh, that was read this now, just now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus prayed that we know the Father. And then in John 1, 18, no one has ever seen God, but the only one and only Son, who himself is God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Jesus revealed, Jesus has explained God. As we say, the Greek says he exegeted him. From the Greek preposition, ek, out of. We exegete scripture. Jesus exegeted the Father. So we know, as we know and learn who Jesus is, he shows us the Father. So Jesus shows us God. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets in many times in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. Wow. So I want to focus on the actual practice of knowing God, what it means, and the benefit of knowing God. I want to emphasize this. In Jesus' prayer, he said, to know God. He wants us to know God. He didn't say, I want them to know about God. About you, Father. I want to know all about you. No, I want them to know you. There is a difference in knowing about the Bible and knowing the Bible. 
There is a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. There are many levels of knowing God, and, and many people know about God, but maybe not on a saving level. There is a certain kind of knowing God that saves, and without that level, I wonder if salvation is possible for them. Jesus said eternal life is knowing God. Not everybody has eternal life. The Bible speaks, when the Bible speaks about knowing God, it is always relational knowing. Relational knowing is where a person knows God and knows and God knows them. Now, God knows everything and everyone. God knows thoughts, our thoughts, actions, motives. But according to Scripture, God does not know everybody relationally. You can read a biography about a, a person, and, and you can know a lot about that person. I read a while ago, uh, a few years ago, the autobiography or the biography of Harry Truman. What a remarkable man. And I learned a lot about Harry Truman, his likes, his dislikes, his family, his background, his decisions. I, I, I could tell you a lot about Harry Truman, but I really don't know Harry Truman. He doesn't know me. I've never met him. Well, I think he's dead now anyway, but, <laughs> but when I was born, he was president. So, uh, but I don't really know him because he doesn't know me. One thing that is true with everyone you are in a relationship with, you know them and they know you. And so um, a couple weeks ago, Javi preached, uh, did a great job. And last week, JP preached. And they had some great things to say. But there's a couple things I noticed that both of them mentioned. And that was the, the importance of knowing God relationally, of having a relationship with God. I kind of pick those thoughts out of their sermon. And I want to kind of talk a little bit about that. A relation with a relationship with, a, with another human is natural. A relationship with God is supernatural. Here's your relationship with a person. First of all, you like the person. I kind of like my wife. You, know? you like the person. You hang out with them. You talk with them. You listen to them. You spend time with them. You learn all about the person, their personality, their character, their likes and dislikes, and your love for that person grows. Building a relationship takes your time, takes your energy, takes your effort, but the same is true with a relationship with God. And relationship with God is sort of like a marriage. Paul, Burkin and Faulkner, some of you know the names, uh, they were professors and family therapists as Abilene Christian years ago. And Paul Faulkner used to teach uh, a marriage class and he would, he would teach young husbands an important thing about the relationship with their wives. And here's what he would say. Find out what makes her tick. Find out what ticks her off. <laughs> Good advice. Good advice. When you come to faith in Christ, and you make a commitment to surrender to Christ and you follow him. Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you believe with your heart and confess Jesus as Lord, you will be saved. So you commit to be a disciple. First Christians were called disciples. A Christian is a disciple, a follower of Christ. So you come to faith and repentance and confession of Christ and you're, you're baptized, you're immersed into Christ. You begin that relationship. And at that baptism, you get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as a birthday present. That's Acts 2.38, of course. And so you get the Holy Spirit indwelling, living in you. The Spirit invades your heart and your mind and your soul and your life. An invasion of the Spirit and that relationship and love and obedience begins. But it's not egalitarian relationship like human relationships. No. He's the master. I'm the doulos, the bond slave. It's the creator-creature relationship. I'm bond, I've been blood-bought. I don't own myself. I've been bought with the blood of Christ. And so that's the supernatural relationship you have with God. Knowing God will change your character. 
A changed life is an evidence of the a person knowing God and the Holy Spirit invading their life and changing them. There's evidence of a changed life. The Bible talks about some people who know God but are not known by God. There's no relationship. Matthew 7, 22, Jesus said, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. It's not saying that Jesus didn't know who they were. Jesus knew their names. He knew a lot of things about them, but it was not a relational knowing because they did not know him and he did not know them back. There was no relationship. They just knew who he was. He knew them. And so this is what I want to emphasize this, this point, knowing God is relational. Now, I say this with a little discomfort to this congregation gathered here. It's almost too basic. I, I'm sure that many of you here uh, know God. I'm not speaking to a people who do not know God. I'm sure many of you have a relationship, you have relationship with God. But we may take it for granted that everyone knows this. There are many people who they know their religion, they know their church liturgy, uh, they know their church doctrines and traditions, but it never really occurs to a lot of people to know God relationally. It never occurs to them that having a relationship with God is part of being a disciple of Christ, a Christian, learning more, obeying, loving God more and more. Now, I say this, and I know this because this was me. <laughs> I grew up in the church. And I learned a lot of Bible. And I was there every Sunday. My dad was an elder. I had to be there. No. But I, I, I knew the doctrine. I learned about God. But I didn't really think much about this relationship with God. It, it almost sounds like too subjective, too feely. I don't know. I, my, my knowledge was mostly academic. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 3, we all possess knowledge. But knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. Get this, verse 3. But whoever loves God is known by God. So I, I learned a lot of Bible in my two years at Sunset School of Preaching in Lubbock, Texas. Actually, this congregation sent Jan and I and Amy and Aaron, my two children, in 1979, this congregation sent us off to Lubbock. I think the Wilkins were here then, and some of the others, the Specs, uh, uh, Lucy Schaefer, and Lucy and Dean, they were, they supported us. This congregation, they made a nice big quilt for us. And it was just one, this congregation sent me off to learn at sunset. And, and I learned a lot of Bible. And it was a wonderful two years. But people say, they say, this about sunset students, how to tell them different classes apart in different groups. And they said, you know, you can tell a freshman at sunset, uh, he's a little overwhelmed. Uh, he has a look of confusion trying to find his classroom. You can tell a sophomore, uh, a little bit more confident, look, he knows where his classroom is. You can tell a junior. Now the junior year is you study Greek. So all the juniors are around, going around with the Greek memory cards. Some of them, they have them tied to their belt, you know, and you see them during chapel, or they're looking, they're trying to memorize the Greek adjectives and adverbs and adnoids and all that. So. <laughs> and you can tell a senior, but you can't tell him much. <laughs> you learn so much. You know, you poke a senior and a verse comes out, a scripture comes out. And I know some actually become kind of know-it-all. Knowledge puffs up. They become, may even some even come obnoxious. Some are ready to answer, quick to debate. Well, they know the Bible. They know verses. They know doctrine. And then a few years ago, someone asked me, Larry, what is God doing in your life? I wasn't really sure what that meant. <laughs> I knew that God did great things for great people in the Bible. God did great things through 
Moses and Abraham, Deborah. What about Esther, Ruth, the Apostle Paul, Peter, the Apostles? Oh, my goodness, God does great things to great people, but that's the Bible. What is God doing in my life? It wasn't really part of my concept of being a Christian. Of being, and I was, I was really pretty content and pretty proud of. I, I know a lot of scripture. Yeah, I know a lot about the Bible. But not all Bible believing religious people know that there is more to being a Christian than learning the doctrine, having the right answers. Again, from A.W. Tozer, he wrote, religious contentment is the enemy of the spiritual life. So many people are, are so happy to just what they know and to move along and we're content with what they know. Now, don't get me wrong. Doctrine is very important. We are all people of the book. The Bible knowledge is vital, very important. But Paul wrote to Titus in Titus 2.1, you, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. And then in that chapter, Titus 2, Paul goes on to explain sound doctrine and its character changes. Of, he says the older men must be temperate and, and respectful. The older women, the younger men, the younger women. He goes on to explain sound doctrine produces character. So he says to Timothy or to Titus, teach sound doctrine. Now, let me ask you, it's okay to respond. Anybody remember or know the definition of sound doctrine? Healthy. You guys didn't, I'm surprised. Healthy teaching. Sound doctrine is healthy teaching. Produces character. Healthy teaching. What could be more healthy than teaching doctrine about knowing God and having godly character. You agree? Yeah. You're all so quiet this morning. That's okay. So every sermon has a how-to. How do we develop this relationship with God? Number one, most important in every Christian's life is love, love God. You love God with all your heart, mind, and strength. You can do that. I can do that. I can love God with my whole heart. Matthew 22, the lawyer says to Jesus, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. 1 John 4, 7, dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The beginning point is loving God. Love is first and foremost in the Christian life, this agape love. 1 Corinthians 13, there remains faith, hope, and love, but the greater of these is love. Thank you. So number two, how do we develop this relationship with God? Well, we know God through his word. Through Jesus, the logos, the word of God, who became flesh, shows us God, as we've said. 1 Peter 1, 23 for you have been born again. There's the new, born, new birth. Of not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. We know God through his word. God reveals himself for who he is. 1 Samuel 3.21, the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh there, and he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. So we have the word of God, the teaching. The doctrine, that's, that's what we need, and that's what we have, and that's how we know God. And the Bible teaches that the knowledge of God is an ever-deepening reality. You already, if you already know God, there's a great deal more you need to know. Jesus said eternal life is to know God. If that is true, if knowing God is the essence of eternal life, then the deepening of that knowledge will be a deepening of that experience of eternal life, of divine life. 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him. Then he goes on to say, 
through these great and very precious promises, we can participate in divine nature. That's relationship with God participating in the divine nature. Can you imagine that? God's own nature, we participate. How do we develop a relationship with God? How do we participate in that divine nature? Number three, follow Jesus. Love God, read his word, love Jesus. There's so much more that can be said. I've just chosen four things, and it's probably maybe there's more deeper, more helpful things, but uh, follow Jesus. How many of you remember the book by Charles Sheldon, In His Steps? I bet you many of you, yeah, I read that years ago. It was actually a novel that was published first in 1896. And it was a, a book about a novel about a small church near Chicago, Illinois. And they decided for one whole year not to do anything, make any decision, do anything without first asking this question. What was the question? There you go. You guys know. What would Jesus do? And uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good thing to do. Uh, it was very popular a few years ago. I remember seeing the WWJD bracelets and uh, bumper stickers, WWJD. You guys remember that? Maybe some younger ones don't. But uh, yeah, what would Jesus do? It's, that's a good thing. In one sense, if you ask yourself, what would Jesus do? You would be largely successful in imitating Christ. In an outward behavior, you would act like Jesus did. Yeah, that's possible to do. But for many people, being Christ-like is simply imitating an outward behavior. What would Jesus do? Well, I'll do that. What would Jesus say? Well, I'll say that. That's imitating the behavior. That's not a bad thing, I'm telling you. Uh, but if you do that, you will do and act a lot like Jesus. And you will look a lot like Jesus in your behavior. But that's not necessarily the same thing as being a partaker of participating in the divine nature. As I understand scripture, the Bible desires us to reproduce his life in us. And so this, uh, this partaker of a divine nature, let me illustrate. An actor learns lines and learns a role learns a script to imitate somebody else. The script makes him act like someone they are not. It's for a play, for a movie. It's not who they really are. It's an imitation of the person, the role. How many of you remember, some of you older, uh, Rich Little, the Impressionist? You know, when he did Richard Nixon, he really sounded like Richard Nixon. Some of you remember that? Or Ronald Reagan? Now, was he Richard Nixon? No. Was he Ronald Reagan? No. Was he John Wayne? Pilgrim coming here to <laughs> kiss all the women and hit all the men. You know, it's something, you know. He wasn't really John Wayne or Richard Nixon. He, he was imitating them. You know, uh, you can train a monkey to act, uh, imitate like a person that's still a monkey. A person can act like Jesus outwardly, but have no more of the spirit. To imitate Jesus outwardly is a good thing, but it's not always real. It kind of becomes a substitute for a real relationship. Now, this doesn't apply to everybody here, I know, but you know, you can go to church and sing the songs and take the supper and outwardly do religious things, but still not know God. There has to be, there's a transformation there, a rebirth. I hope if you don't, Forget anything of this lesson. I hope you remember this line. Ready? God wants participation, not imitation. Participation, not imitation. Write that down. A child takes on the nature of his father. We bear the nature of our father. And again, Tozer, I like to read A.W. Tozer, as you can guess. He wrote, nearness is likeness. And you imitate the one you admire. You become, an axiomatic truth of the Bible is you become like the God you serve. That's uh, first, or Romans, I'm sorry, Psalm 115, 
uh, the, the idols. Uh, you become like those who you worship. You become like the God you serve. Participating in God and the nature of God will take your time. If you, whatever you love, whatever is most important to your life, you become like that. Number four, how do you develop a relationship with God and how do you participate in the divine nature? You remain, you abide, you hang on, you never give up to cry on Christ. Jesus said to his true disciples, I am the true vine and you are the branches. Remain, abide in me. So as we finish up, just a few words. Uh, it's interesting that the Holy Spirit uses the word in the Greek, it's gnosko the word for knowing to know. There's different Greek words for know, but uh, gnosko indicates relationship. And this word Jesus used in our text today, John 17, three, this is eternal life that they gnosko you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you sent. They know you. So to know, to knowing is the word used for the most intimate physical relationship between a husband and wife in marriage. Adam knew Eve. Abraham knew Sarah. Mary said when she was told by the angel, you're with child, she said, how can this be? I've never gnoscoed a man. Modern translation says, how can this be? I'm still a virgin, but it's a, other translations, I've never known a man. Think about that word, relationship, a very intimate relationship. And I want that relationship with God. How do you know God? Number one, you love God. And the love of God compels me to know him. Number two, God reveals himself in his word. Number three, you follow Christ. You walk in his steps, not merely imitation, but participation. And number four, you remain, you abide. The more you know God, the deeper and more intimate you will be with God. Knowing God requires being like God, his holiness. And no one ever does this perfectly, of course. It's a process. We're growing. We're learning. But knowing God is not without struggles and sometimes pain and disappointment and frustration. Let me illustrate this by saying I had a loving relationship with my parents. But my parents disciplined me. They taught me. They didn't give me everything I wanted. <laughs> uh, they were pretty strict. And sometimes pain was involved, if you know what I mean. And, uh, but it was training in righteousness. That's sort of like the relationship with God. Uh, people say, just say the sinner's prayer and, or just get in the water and you'll go to heaven. There's more to... Christ and more to your Christian life than that, isn't there? And being saved is not just when you die, go to heaven. That's part of it. Being saved is now. Your relationship with God is Christ now. Knowing God is this. Knowing God is inward sweetness. A relationship with God is supernatural energy. Knowing God is blessed peace. Knowing God is a joyful life. Knowing God is a life of gratitude, of thankfulness. Hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm okay. Tell people I'm thankful. I'm joyful. That'll get their attention. Knowing God is a focused, holy life. A relationship with God is inward beauty. This is a big one. It's free from guilt. Freedom from guilt. Knowing God is assurance of eternal life. That's knowing God. That's what I want. Is that what you want? If we can help you, please come as we stand and sing.